Hi, my name is Ivan, and I lead Super BMB at Distant Motion. And I'm Philippe Aleman. I'm in charge of our embedded software at Distant Motion. Um, we would like to welcome you to our presentation today on the topic of software verification for a surgical robot. And it's a great pleasure to be part of the Vector Testing Days this year. We are going to share with you insight and experiences on our software verification uh, processes and tools that we implemented in order to develop Dexter, our surgical robot. Um, we will start with uh, some slide on the company and the product in order to give you the background. And then we will deep dive into software verification and we will end by sharing some best practices uh, that we find out during our journey. Starting with the company and the product, Distant Motion was founded in 2012. It's a spin-off from the robotics lab from the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. We are designing, developing and manufacturing our robot completely in Switzerland. Since the beginning, uh, we made a clinical co-development with surgeons and nurses as we need to perfectly understand their workflow in order to bring robotic surgery there where it really makes sense. The mission of the company is on the one hand to reduce the complexity of robotic surgery and on the other to democratize the technology. Uh, each mid-sized hospital around the globe shall be able to have access to robotic surgery in order to offer top-notch care to its patients. So who's behind Dexter? We are about, now about more than uh, 70 employees uh, and we are growing quite fastly. Um, we are covering all different kinds of, of professions. We are um, a very uh, dynamic and passionate team. Uh, we have just raised 90 million US dollars in the latest investment round. Uh, so it's really an exciting time right now. So I may introduce Dexter. Dexter is a surgical robot for minimally invasive care. So what does that mean? Uh, if you think of surgery in this part of the body, uh, one of the possibilities is to cut the abdomen open in order to have access to the inner organs. And what we do is we do some tiny incisions in order to pass through some instruments that you can see here, for example, and, uh, and as well an endoscope in order to have the vision. On the left part of this slide, you see what we call the surgeon console. Here, the surgeon is holding two handles and with them, he's controlling the two arms of the robot that you can see in the middle of the picture. Um, he has seven degrees of freedom. So he can position the tip of the instrument in 3D and then he has a fully articulated wrist at the, at the end of the instrument. On the right side of the picture, you see also another arm. This is the endoscope arm. The surgeon has also the possibility to control it um, via the handles that he's holding. If we have uh, now a closer look, look at the instruments, you see here this, those fully articulated wrists. Uh, we have uh, at the moment a needle holder, for example, if you want to sew tissues. And we have also like dissectors, graspers, scissors. And of course, the portfolio is, is growing very, very fastly right now. Let's have a look at the impression of, the, of Dexter's first uh, surgery in, in clinical use. On the right picture, you see the surgeon holding the two handles to control the robot. He is looking at the monitor showing the 3D pictures of the inside of the abdomen. And on the other picture, you see the two arms of the robot. You see the patient in the middle and the instrument entering the, the patient. Uh, let's have another look of the robots, this time in figures. We have 16 different firmware. We have also 16 different software for unknown pedigrees. We have 45 communicating nodes, more than 1 million lines of code. It's more than 5,000 components for one robot. So you can imagine that software verification is quite a challenging task. Having a look at the EE architecture, 
On the right side, you see a, a simplified version of the, of the architecture. On the top part, you see the, what we call the motion capture. Here, it's where we, uh, we capture the, what the surgeon is doing with his handles. Then we have a central uh, ECU with the kinematic model of the robot. Here, we are then computing all the set points of the different motors on the different joints of the arms. And of course, we read each position back in order to be sure that uh, the robot is not doing any unwanted movement. This EE architecture, we are then reproducing it in the canoe simulation setup, where we have all robot nodes. We also have extra capital nodes uh, where we have the motor encoders emulation. This allows us that when, the, when we are testing the central uh, ECU with the motion model and it's sending some commands to the motors, then of course we want that the motors are sending a correct position back Otherwise, the, the central ECU would go into fault. We have also uh, integrated into Canoe a MATLAB forward and backward motion model. And with this, we are able to have a virtual surgeon or do central monitoring. Let's start with software verification, which is the main part of this um, presentation. Um, the norm IEC 62304 uh, focus on software lifecycle for the medical industry. On this, uh, on this picture, you see the standard V-shape process uh, for the development of a programmable electrical medical system. And the part highlighted in green is the part uh, for software development. This, norms, this norm defines three software safety class, A, B, and C, uh, with C being the highest one. Um, if your software may uh, severely injure the patient or even kill him, then the software has to be uh, of class C. All of our software are class C, of course. If the arm is doing an unwanted movement, this can be very dangerous for the patient. Um, and the norm for class C uh, software safety classes then is demanding different kinds of activities, among others, software unit tests software system tests, and uh, as well the documentation of the software detailed specification. So from this, we developed our software test strategy uh, that you can see on that slide. We have tests that we are doing like statically. For there, we are testing MISRAC and other uh, coding rules. We are performing data and control flow analysis. Then we have a dynamic uh, testing part where we are testing in white and black box. Uh, you see some here different tests that we are doing from functional to limit analysis. And for this dynamic test, we decided to choose the tools from Vector. We have Vectorcast that we use for software unit testing and software integration testing. And we have Canoe in combination with Vitest Studio uh, to do software hardware integration testing and software system testing. I will now hand over to Ivan, who will dive a bit more in those different uh, aspects of the software um, verification. So Ivan, please, maybe okay. we'll just switch so you have a... Exactly. Thank you, Philippe. So going a little bit more in details, software unit testing, as Philippe mentioned, we use Vectorcast. So the workflow that you can see in the slide, it's pretty simple. The test engineer is going, is going to design the test cases and then they are going to commit into our integration server. So we use Jenkins, and Jenkins then it's going to take care of these new test cases, and it's going to execute them in a simulated environment. It's also very important to mention that we have to keep traceability in our, in our design history file manager, that it's Polarium. So thanks to Vectorcast, it's all, it has already embedded a Vectorcast gateway where we can have requirements, test cases, and test reports. Uh, Vectorcast is TubeSuv, uh, but certified, so it's 62304 compliant, so there is no extra effort in terms of tool qualification. So going for software system testing, so it gets a little bit more complex, but the setup is not going to be different from the one that you have seen if you work with hardware in the loop test benches. So basically here we use VT system to simulate the physical signals, but we use Canoe to simulate the environment of the nodes. To design the test cases, we use Vita Studio, that thanks to all this complete toolchain, 
we are able to perform this hardware in the loop and these software system test cases. Uh, Canoe and Vita Studio have a safety manual that we highly recommend to read and to base the tool validation rationale based on that safety manual. All of this process is also executed in Jenkins, but we'll talk a little bit, me, a little bit more in detail in the following slide. At software system testing for continuous integration, it can get a little bit more complex if you don't choose the right tools. So we need to choose exactly the tools that are fitting our, pros our process. So we have Polarion, that is our DHF manager. So we get the requirements from Polarion thanks to a tool that is the Polarion connectivity tool. This tool, also developed by Vector, allows us to get the requirements directly from Polarion, integrate them in Vitesse Studio, and then have this full traceability between requirements, test cases, and then afterwards, test reports. So basically, the workflow consists on having the requirements, build the project, we using as well the test unit, build CLI from Vector, that it's a CLI version of the Vitesse Studio, and then the engineering effort, it's in Canoe, because we need to use Canoe as a comm server, as we need to change the VT system config, we need to change the sensor config, we need to change the user files. So for this, there's a little bit of engineering effort, but documentation is great. So everything is prepared just to set your, your software system test range into a continuous integration environment. Afterwards, when the test execution is finalized, we also use the Polarion connectivity util in order to synchronize the test results with Polarion. In this slide, you can see a couple of examples of our test benches. So you can see, you can identify a VT system. You can see several ECUs that we have. And in the screen, you can see that we are designing test cases using Vita Studio. As mentioned before by Philippe, we want to share our expertise and our experience with vector tools with everyone. So we want to share some best practices that you, we have identified, and it will ease a lot the use of vector tools within your company. Regarding the file structure, it's, it's not something that it's hidden that choosing the right file structure or naming convention, it's something that it, it can get pretty hard. You never know if the decision has been the good one, but at the end you have to decide something. So we have identified that the best solution is just to really split the Canoe configuration and the Vita Studio. So there's really a difference between the folders of, of Canoe and Vita Studio. So we will avoid having interference between the tools. Inside the Vita Studio folder structure, we always want to place a generics folder. And inside the generics, we want to place some generics libraries, generic parameters, generic system variables, generic, generic libraries that will allow you to be used within all the test, within all the ECUs that you would like to test. At the end, you will implement also some folders for every ECU that you would like to test. And inside of it, you, you want to use the shareable folders. The shareable folders allow you to have the project and increase the scalability of the project. Let's say that you have several test units and you would like to avoid compilation errors between different ECUs, uh, compilation errors between different files. You would like to use the shareable folders. You would like to place all the libraries, all the parameters that are common within the, the complete project. And then you would like to reference that shareable folders inside the test units. This will avoid a lot of problems in compilation, uh, files incompatibilities, so it's really a nice to do. Regarding advanced functions, uh, depending on the ECU that you are testing, it might contain complex state machines, uh, complex VT system simulations, complex data at the end. So you would like to implement the same state machine that you would have in the ECU in Vita Studio. It can get a little bit hard and it can, you will spend a little bit of time, but at the end, it will allow you to set your ECU in the state that you would like to set it and then perform your test case. And then avoid to have dependencies between test cases and developing your, st your test in an atomic and simplified way. So in these functions, you would like to include resets of the ECU, either if you use a command to reset or either you use a power supply to reset, you would like to reset also your system variables, your envir environmental variables, and you will also like to set the state machine to the state that you would like to set. So I, will, I want to set this, the ECU in this state. You will have a function that will have the reset, the reset of your internal variables, and also the set the ECU in the desired state, and then you do the test. So this will simplify a lot the test sequencing. And then for 
when you when you have to use VT system, it can get a little bit complex because it has dependencies on the name that you configure on the VT system configuration. But then to avoid that, you know that the sequence to initialize a digital signal, an analog signal, it's the same always. So you would like to create an API to create a generic library that will do this for you. This will have the same sequence. It will, it, it will initialize the VT system card. And then you will also need to reference externally using a parameter or using another sort of variable instead of having to do the same sequence all over again. Please create VT system APIs for your digital analog and all the cards that you have. You, you will see the benefit when you use it. And then one of the main problems that we experience in embedded systems development is scalability. So the ECU that you're testing today, maybe it's going to be different from the one you're testing tomorrow. Or the hardware revision, it's going to change. So to absorb all of this change in an efficient way at software VNB, you would like to think on this beforehand. So use build an abstraction layer between the VT system and your real ECU. With this abstraction layer, it could be a breakout box. It could be a breakout PCB. So in, if there is any change, any remapping of the GPIOs, any remapping of the hardware, any new hardware revision, you will be able to react really fast to these changes. And this will increase a lot your scalability and your efficiency in your software VNB processes. So that's all. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, right now, we will open a live Q&A session. And we will try just to solve all the questions, all the comments, all the doubts that you have the best that we can. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.